Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel and today for the third time and I truly, truly hope it's not the last time even though I'm asking Scott so many times to come and join me. I am joined by Mr. Scott Ritter who is a former United States Marine Corps intelligence officer and weapons inspector. Welcome back, Scott. Thank you for having me. So today we will go all over the place, but let's start with the freshest, latest, like this is never ending because every day there is something happening, news. And that is, um, I will quote him, don't bother to come to convince me. <laughs> um, this is president of Turkey, Erdogan, saying this to Finland and Sweden, who is apparently sending their delegations to Ankara, to Turkey, to convince him to sign the um, agreement for them to join NATO. So my first question is in regards of this. What kind of deal do you think he is trying to negotiate by saying no to Finland and Sweden? And do you think he will ultimately finally say yes and if yes or no, either way, what will be the outcome? Erdogan has made it clear that he does not object to the expansion of NATO. So that's a very worrisome uh, development because I, I would like to believe that uh, rational thinkers would see Finland and Sweden's uh, joining NATO as one of the more destabilizing um, acts that can be taken at this point in time. Um, Article 10 of the NATO Charter uh, you know, does not speak of an open door policy. You keep hearing people in NATO say, oh, there's an open door policy. We, we have to consider all uh, legitimate applications. No, you don't. Uh, Article 10 actually says that um, even if somebody's qualified to join, NATO must consider what the impact on the overall security of the organization will be if that nation joins. And there can be no doubt that if uh, Sweden and Finland join, uh, NATO's security will be detrimentally impacted. Um, it, and even worse for Sweden and, and, and Finland, uh, they may not survive their membership application, if, uh, if you know what I mean. Uh, I'm not, you know, I can't speak on behalf of Russia. I wouldn't pretend to. And the last thing I think Russia would want is another war. Um, but I mean, what part of Russia will not permit the continued eastward expansion of NATO does Finland not understand? Um, and, and getting back to the point, what part of that equation does Erdogan not understand? Um, but Erdogan's objections are real. Uh, they're not fake. So, you know, the concept of Finland and Sweden coming in and making some sort of quick deal, um, a quid pro quo, so to speak, um, is laughable. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that a deal can't be made, but it would require Finland and Sweden, especially Sweden, to reverse decades of open door policy uh, that is had with um, Turkish Kurds. Uh, in particular, those who are affiliated with the PKK, which uh, the, the Turkish government views as a terrorist organization. Um, mm -hmm. Turkish Kurds um, live in Sweden, organize in Sweden. The Swedish government supports them. Uh, the Fens uh, also are, are, are sympathetic to their cause. And um, Turkey feels that it cannot allow a nation that actively supports a terrorist organization that is organized to kill and disrupt Turkey. They can't allow them into, into NATO. Um, so this is a real objection. And it would take um, something uh, that I don't think Sweden is prepared to do. That is the total reversal of policy, the eviction of Kurds, the depoliticization of the Kurdish groups in Sweden. And since Sweden has been a nation that has been receptive to immigrant populations, this reversal uh, would create, I think, tremendous domestic problems for the Swedish government, which is not a dictatorial government, it's a democratic government. So if, you, 
irritate your populations, you tend to be voted out of office. And um, right now, I think one of the reasons why Sweden and Finland are jumping on this bandwagon is that it is a politically um, popular move in both Sweden and Finland. Uh, again, the, I honestly think that if they thought about what, what, what could happen to them, um, <laughs> maybe they wouldn't support it. Uh, I mean, especially Finland, who has enjoyed eight decades of peace and prosperity. Um, there's a reason why the standard of living in Sweden and Finland is so high. That's because they don't squander billions of dollars every year on unnecessary defense spending because they, they don't uh, have to worry about attacks from anyone. Their neutrality is, is, a, is a protective cloak. Russia has never threatened uh, Finland or Sweden um, in, 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 in the history of the Russian Federation. And even during the Soviet Union times, um, there was no direct threat against either Finland or Sweden. So the, the notion that now that Russia has launched a special military operation that is limited in scope and scale to Ukraine and dealing with the unique problems that are generated by Ukraine, that this somehow poses a threat to Finland and Sweden is ludicrous. It's laughable. Um, so, but for whatever reason, the, um, the, the information warfare aspect of uh, how the West has responded to Russia's actions in Ukraine have um, allowed popular opinion to be mobilized in Finland and, 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 and Sweden uh, in favor of joining NATO. Um, but again, you know, will, will that outweigh, especially in Sweden, um, Sweden's long-held stance regarding um, its, its, its relationship with Turkish Kurds? And um, I, don't, I don't think there's anything substantive that the Swedes can offer. Uh, it would all be superficial. It would all be a papering over. It would be false promises. And I don't think Turkey's in the business of accepting false promises anymore. So even though Erdogan's objections aren't the ones that I would like him to have, which is under no circumstances will NATO expand, um, they are real objections and they're likely to um, cause a delay in um, NATO uh, formally um, asking Finland and Sweden to join their organization. So you don't think he will ever say yes to it? I didn't say that. I, I, I don't think that he's going to say yes in a very short period of time. Um, okay. But I think that if, if I were in Erdogan's position, I would demand that Sweden um, put up or shut up, so to speak, meaning that I don't want to hear promises. I want to see results. I want to see you kick the Kurds out of your country. I want to see your your parliament pass legislation that bans the PKK operating on your soil. I want to see irreversible actions undertaken by Sweden so that Turkey will know uh, going forward that, um, that the Kurds will never again have a safe haven in Sweden and that Sweden will never be a nation that supports the PKK. Um, because anything less than that, you know, once Sweden joins NATO, they can do anything they want. Um, and, and Turkey, uh, you know, will be left holding the bag, so to speak. Uh, and Turkey has burned, been burned by NATO already. Uh, you know, Turkey allowed Greece to rejoin uh, the mm -hmm. NATO uh, structure in uh, 1980. And uh, they feel that they've been burned by Greece ever since. Uh, because now that Greece is a member of NATO, Greece can do things with impunity. Um, and Turkey is not willing to get stabbed in the back. Again, this is a real problem. For, uh, for Turkey, uh, Sweden's uh, coddling of the of the Kurds is a real problem for Turkey, um, and because it's a consensus-driven uh, vote, um, unless Sweden is able to convince Turkey that um, whatever measures they take against the Kurds are irreversible, are permanent, I don't see Turkey allowing Sweden in. And will that help me to understand this? If he will stay with no. Can they still join it or they can't? No, they can't. Uh, what, it has to be a unanimous decision. Uh, NATO is a consensus driven organization. And if Turkey says no, then uh, there will be no formal uh, invitation to either Finland or Sweden. That doesn't mean that uh, Finland and Sweden can't continue the, um, the programs of cooperation they already have with NATO. Uh, they already 
uh, train with NATO forces. They already uh, buy uh, equipment that is similar to uh, NATO equipment. Um, and no matter what happens, I see both Finland and Sweden moving in this direction to, uh, to prepare themselves for eventual membership. Um, you know, but uh, unless Sweden, um, you know, takes serious action in a very short period of time, which is pretty much impossible from a legislative standpoint to introduce sweeping legislation and bum rush it through um, in, in a month's time um, is unheard of, uh, especially given the, the real kickback uh, that they'll get from the Swedish, um, you know, from the Swedish people, uh, who I believe um, will be morally outraged at Sweden abandoning the Kurds uh, to placate the Turks. Um, so that's a problem. You know, and there's another problem too. There's Croatia. Uh, Croatia, <laughs> the Croatian president has said, you know, NATO needs and Europe needs to focus on solving the problems in the Balkans before we invent new problems in the North. Uh, at least he's honest, honest enough to admit that inviting Sweden and Finland into NATO is a provocation that will complicate, not simplify uh, NATO's life. Um, but his point is, why do we want to create a huge distraction up north um, mm -hmm. with the most direct conflict with Russia when we have a huge problem here in the Balkans? I mean, nobody's talking about Kosovo mm -hmm. and the ongoing Serbian efforts to derecognize Kosovo. Nobody's talking about the Bosnian Serbs um, trying to undo the Dayton Accords uh, so they can rejoin or so they can join Serbia. Uh, and Serbia then taking over Kosovo, creating a greater Serbia. Uh, this is a real problem, a real problem. And, um, you know, and once that happens, what happens with, um, you know, Macedonia and uh, Albania? Um, <laughs> you know, do, do, does, does, does that turn into a war? So the Balkans are in real danger of unraveling um, and creating a, a renewed military conflict in the heart of Europe. And Croatia's point is, we need to fix this problem first before we create another problem. Now, there's a conflict between the president and the and the uh, prime minister. The prime minister in Croatia says that um, you know he he will uh, push for allowing Finland and, and Sweden to join. So there's a domestic political power struggle going on, but it's a it's a real issue that needs to be debated at at, at NATO. I mean, um, you know, NATO really needs to have a long, detailed discussion about you know, is allowing Finland and Sweden into NATO at this point in time um, harmful or helpful to the, uh, to the alliance? And uh, I think the, the rational player will say it's extraordinarily harmful. Um, it, but right now, NATO's, uh, NATO's in a crisis. You know, the, there is no NATO unity right now. Uh, Ukraine has thrown NATO uh, into, uh, into a tailspin and they're trying to adapt to it. They, they, they speak great words, but the actions that they're able to follow up with are, are not as impressive. And I think some people view allowing Finland and uh, Sweden in um, as a measure uh, that will um, give NATO the, the initiative um, that Russia will be reacting to them as opposed to them reacting to Russia. But you know, these are silly, geopolitical power struggles um, that may sound good in the halls of Parliament, of the European Parliament and the halls of NATO, um, but the end result will be Russian steel tearing asunder Finnish bodies. Finland doesn't stand a chance against Russia if Russia chose to, uh, to, turn, to, to activate its military technical uh, option. Uh, Sweden has no military worthy of the name. They've demilitarized in, in effect. Um, so the, the, the concept of either Sweden or Finland being able to stand up to an enraged Russia is ludicrous. And what, England has provided security guarantees? With what army? With what air force? With what navy? Uh, England's a joke. I mean, when the, when the British uh, defense minister visited Croatia, uh, I think in the fall, last fall, uh, he, he wanted a meeting with the Croatian um, Prime or uh, Defense Minister and, and Prime Minister, and the, and they said, "Why would we meet with you? One, your military's a joke, uh, you know. So you, you bring nothing to the table, and two, you're not a member of the European Union. So leave." He was humiliated. 
Um, and so England offering Finland and Sweden security guarantees, there's nothing England can do to guarantee their security. If Russia came across the border, there's literally nothing England can do. There's nothing anybody can do unless they're willing to um, go to war against Russia. And right now, I don't think anybody is. Thank you, Scott. I want to say now this. Watching the situation, learning from you, hearing others um, explaining that I am actually getting a sense, and I will ask you because I came across this information very recently, I'm getting a sense that somehow they are trying to distract us from something much more important with this war in Ukraine. And I came across this um, information that I want to read to you and ask you, because this actually might be something you might know about. In December 2021, Russia has created in an Arctic region a floating nuclear power plant. And as Putin explained, is to explore the reaches of the Arctic. Now, when I was getting more information about this, it looks like it might have something to do with the Arctic Council, which has eight countries within it. So it's Canada, US, Iceland, Norway, Sweden, Finland, Poland, and Russia. And every two years, the chairmanship of those countries rotates. And now from 2021 to 2023, it is Russia who is actually the chairmanship. So I would like to ask you, what do you think is the real purpose of this nu nuclear plant? And what the heck is going on there? Because I feel like that, that whatever is happening with NATO and Ukraine, this might be as cruel as it sounds, really major distraction from other things. Well, the Arctic Council is, has been around for some time. Um, and the interesting thing about the Arctic Council is that it is um, designed um, not to discuss military matters, meaning that they purposely said, we don't want to introduce military issues into the Arctic, um, that we want to solely focus on the economic and ecological aspects of, of the Arctic. It was, it, it's actually a very responsible approach. Um, and it, because what it does is it takes away uh, most, um, most ground for um, political disagreement. I mean, where most nations disagree on is when, when you get into military type issues where there's a threat of force, et cetera. It forced people actually to sit down and say, what's in the best interests of the ecology of the Arctic? And what's the, the, the most equitable distribution of the economic benefits of, of the Arctic? And how do we balance um, mm -hmm. exploiting the Arctic economically with the, the requirement for, for ecology? And frankly speaking, it was one of the better um, international forums to discuss climate change uh, and how to uh, come up with a, a strategy to, um, to try and, because you're right there in the Arctic. I mean, you know, the, just a little while ago, we had minus 20 degree temperatures here in uh, New York. And while we were freezing to death, it was 79, 80 degrees at the Arctic Circle. Unheard of temperatures. Um, so there's, there's a problem there. And uh, you know, this, the, the Arctic Council was you know, directly involved in assessing this. And they produce products that are very useful to the United Nations and the international community when it comes to the impact of climate change on the Arctic. Um, so th this, this is, this is a good thing, um, unfortunately, and, and, and again, now we'll come back to the, uh, it wasn't a nuclear uh, power plant. It was a, it was a nuclear powered ice break that has a tremendous amount of power generation capability, but the icebreaker, uh, will enable Russia to not only clear, um, shipping lanes, but also to access areas for further exp uh, exploration and scientific uh, research, uh, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, this, this shows Russia's commitment to, um, to the Arctic. And of course, Russia has um, one of the longest Arctic coastlines, uh, you know, uh, borders with, with the Arctic region. Um, Russia coming in uh, was 
many nations objected to it. Many nations didn't want to deal with Russia uh, because, you know, there's Russophobia that has gripped all of Europe. And this is pre-Ukraine. Uh, but Russia came in, took over the council, and indicated they wanted to do the council's business as usual. Uh, and Russia was doing that. Uh, after Russia initiated special military operation, however, um, the Arctic Council froze its relations with Russia, meaning there's no more Arctic Council. It's frozen. And as a result, many military projects that would otherwise have been stymied or, 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 or hampered by the diplomatic people saying, whoa, you don't, you know, let's, you don't want to do that. They're now free to run range. The U.S. Army now is forming Arctic brigades. Uh, NATO is carrying out Arctic exercises. Russia is militarizing the Arctic. Um, and this very well could turn into a new uh, military front uh, of, of conflict um, in the Arctic region. Um, Russia is very concerned about, um, you know, for instance, uh, lately the United States has been sending destroyers that normally operate um, in the Mediterranean or in the North Atlantic. Uh, they've been sending them around the Northern Strait um, as a freedom of exercise, uh, freedom of navigation exercise. The problem is these destroyers are armed with um, nuclear tipped Tomahawk missiles. And uh, when you get up north, you've suddenly shortened the, um, the distance between the Tomahawk being launched and Russia's strategic nuclear deterrent um, in, in their silos or if they're mobile missiles in their garrisons. And Russia, every time the US uh, deploys these destroyers, is very concerned because of the potential for a, um, a, a, a nuclear first strike. Uh, this is the kind of irresponsible actions that are going on right now. Um, now, do I think that, that the Ukraine is designed to distract us away from that? No, I think Ukraine happened. Um, I think what, what's happening now is the West is taking advantage of every opportunity to further constrain Russia, further remove Russia from the international community, and to exploit the vacuum that's created to their advantage. And uh, that's what I see happening in the Arctic. And it's very dangerous because um, Russia views the Arctic literally as its backyard. Uh, indeed, if you remember a couple of years ago, a Russian submarine went under the uh, North Pole and planted a Russian mm -hmm. flag, said it belongs to us. Um, so Russia is not going to simply sulk away and let the West do whatever it wants in the Arctic. And if the West, for instance, allows Sweden and NATO to join, uh, Sweden and Finland to join NATO, um, you know, that will only um, further Russia's um, uh, their, 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 their desire, their intensity, their, their, their national requirement to, uh, to control the Arctic. I mean, it's not going to cause Russia to back away. Russia will just double down. So it's a very dangerous situation. I, I see the potential for conflict everywhere. Um, and I don't see any diplomatic off-ramps. I mean, the Arctic Council was the, uh, was the logical diplomatic off-ramp to avoid military conflict in the Arctic. That's been frozen. There's nothing now. There's no breaks. And, um, and Russia is not going to react gently to uh, NATO's efforts to bring in Sweden and Finland because they're right up there in the Arctic Circle. So, uh, you know, it, it's a very dangerous situation. Thank you, Scott, for explaining. I want to ask you now, before I go into China and Poland, I want to ask you a straightforward question, because this has been on my mind. Don't you think that what's happening in Azovstal has something to do with DARPA and brain initiative? Like there are some experiments going on in humans or have been going on. That's why it takes so long. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Uh, in, in a, it, it doesn't make any sense to, I mean, look, I. As of stall in the in the tunnels and the bunkers predated this conflict. They go back to the Cold War. They were built by the Soviets to allow forty thousand workers uh, an opportunity to ride out a nuclear attack because As of stall was a strategic site. The Russians believed that in a nuclear war it would be struck. 
So it built these bunkers um, that were designed to have the, 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 the workers of the factory, maybe even their families, go down below ground and, and survive uh, a nuclear attack, uh, ride out the radiation, and then come back up and, and hopefully be able to, uh, you know, fanciful thinking, but get on with their lives. Yeah. So, you know, that was the purpose of it. Um, they're not, they weren't configured to be a, a bio research and development facility. Um, you know, this requires a unique equipment. Um, it requires air purification. It requires, it, there, there would be a whole bunch of stuff above ground that would have to be above ground to help pump air in and out. And um, it, it, it's not a logical place to, pl to put a, a bio um, safety lab level three or level four. Um, it's a, it's a, it was a active steel plant. I mean, they produced rolling steel. They, they produced steel for Ukraine, for Russia, for the world. Uh, it was a major steel manufacturing plant, uh, which is filthy, by the way, filthy. Um, there's a reason why you see the steel workers come out with black on their face and all this. So the cleanliness demands of a biosafety lab alone I mean you want it to be as far away from Azov steel as possible. Um, you wouldn't put it uh, underground there. So I, I, I think that there's there's a lot of conspiracy theory type uh, thinking going on right now because of, you know, because we didn't know what was going on down there. We just know that people disappeared into the ground and they were there and, and they were fighting like like the devil to, uh, to, to survive. And then everybody was trying to get them out. Um, what we forget is that the Azov Regiment, which is headquartered in Mariupol, um, is the elite, Ideolo militarized ideological formation in Ukraine. And right now, the Zelensky government has been taken over by right sector, right wing political people who are very close to Azov. And so I think the, the demand, one reason they fought so hard is they know what their fate will be if they, they surrendered. And we still don't know what their fate's going to be, even though Russia allowed them to be evacuated I think the Russian parliament right now is considering legislation that makes Azov a terrorist organization, and that would prevent Russia from uh, returning any Azov members to Ukraine because they would have to be uh, tried. Um, but, you know, I mean, that's a, that's a separate political question for Russia to answer. But the, the point is, these guys fought not because they're the bravest of the brave. They, they fought the fight of the desperate, that they had no alternative. Um, and yet some people are misreading that as they are fighting to defend something other than their own lives. Um, no, I don't think they were defending anything. Uh, do I think that there might have been um, some private military contractors uh, with close links to NATO down there? Yes, this was the Azov Regiment. Um, so they, I believe, because they weren't active duty NATO personnel, I believe they stayed on because their contracts were paying them. And um, they ended up getting caught up when Mariupol was surrounded. And um, they, they got trapped down there. I believe many of them died. I believe some of them might be wounded. And I believe others have surrendered and will be prosecuted by the, by the Russians. But I don't see anything nefarious in that. Um, you know, there's this, these rumors about Eric Olson, the four-star admiral. Um, no. You think a 70-year-old four-star admiral who's a hero of the United States is going to debase himself by um, working for Azov Regiment? No. Um, I don't think you're going to see any senior Americans. There was a senior Canadian that apparently was captured. I, I, I'd like to know more about what his fate is. Um, but again, he, he went down there more as an act of redemption. I mean, he left, he left the military service in Canada under a cloud, uh, investigated for... Um, sexual misconduct, and uh, he fled to uh, Ukraine under a contract um, as, a, as an act of uh, distraction and redemption. I, I would say uh, Eric Olson, the four-star admiral, has no such situation to run away from here in the United States. Um, he's a hero, and um, he's 70 years old, so I don't see him, you know, he may know a lot, but he can't do a lot. So uh, the, he has no utility there, so I don't see him being there. Um, 
I think we're going to find out when when all this is said and done is that what was underground in in Azovstal was a bunch of World War or Cold War era bunkers uh, filled with dead people, filled with wounded people, and filled with suffering people, and that they surrendered to end their suffering. Um, and then you're going to uh, the the real story is the one that the West is going to ignore. Uh, because now that Russia has these criminals in their hand, they have them. They're going to be interrogated, and remember, their victims are alive, not just dead. Russia is taking statements from the citizens of Mariupol, who no longer have to cower in fear from these Azov terrorists. And now that you have the terrorists in the docket, um, you interrogate them. You get statements. You get statements from the witnesses. You gather forensic evidence, and there is forensic evidence. And these people will be prosecuted and their crimes will be revealed. And that's the big embarrassment that will come to Ukraine and the West, to Ukraine for allowing such an organization to exist on its soil, um, supported by its government, and to the West for giving sucker and support to this mm -hmm. hateful ideology. That's the embarrassment. That's the real story of, of Mariupol and Azovstal, not some secret biological lab. No, no. I could be proven wrong. Russia may come out tomorrow and say, we found the secret biological lab. And then we, we talk about that. But right now, mm -hmm. I don't see any evidence that points in that direction. I don't anticipate them finding anything like that. You know, they have an ongoing investigation about the real biological lab. Um, you know, this, this is real. This is substantive. They have documents. Um, yes. And I, 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 I don't think anybody should be distracted in hopes that even something more nefarious will be found in Azovstal. Like I said, the last place in the world that I would put a, a, a level three or level four biosafety lab is in the dungeon of an active working steel plant. <laughs> it's the dirtiest place in the world. And the air purification requirements alone would be uh, prohibitive. Thank you for this, Scott. Um, now, going back to NATO, I have like literally so many questions all over the place, but let's go back to NATO. Again, I'm learning all of this because this is pretty much all new to me, but I'm coming across certain informations and I would like to hear from you about this. So NATO, as I understand, there are different levels or um, groups within NATO. So there is this NATO that is with guns, military part of NATO, and there is also the NATO that is the defense security, cyber defense security conglomerate. So it's the cyber defense security. I want to ask you, what is the role of this? And are they involved in some other things that maybe we should know, but we don't really know about as far as the cyber attacks on citizens, for example? Okay, again, we'll start with the premise that NATO is a consensus-driven organization. Um, so anytime for NATO to act as NATO requires all 30 members to say, this is what we want to do. Um, you can't have a situation where you have three or four or five members get together in secret and act under the umbrella of NATO without the others knowing that. That's not how NATO works. It's a very um, inefficient organization in that way. Um, so when we speak of the cyber conglomerate, it is a collective um, effort by NATO to secure the NATO, the, the, the cyber um, systems, this computer systems and the networks of NATO from outside attack. Um, there may be, I think it's primarily defensive oriented, and I'll tell you why I think so. Because when defense is, is 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 something that is done is better done collectively, meaning that if I'm going, if you and I are under threat of a cyber attack from an outside player, we're at greater risk if we try to handle it ourselves, because it allows them to isolate us. But if you and I now communicate and say, "Hey, I got I got this this code on my on 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 a, on a you know, this malware came in on it. Have you seen this? And you go, yeah, I got that too. Well, where'd you get it from? I got it from this IP address. I got it from this one. Now we're collaborating. We're knowing more about the threat. We're able to defend better against it. And I think that's what we're seeing with this cyber conglomerate is, is collective defense of NATO. The attack, offensive cyber, 
is first of all, some of the most closely guarded secrets of any um, a military or intelligence uh, organization, how they penetrate the uh, computer networks, the computer security of, of, of their target. Uh, because the moment you, you, you get detected, they shut you down, you know? And you, so if you spend all this money developing a capability and all that, and then you make a mistake, you shut it down. You know how you make a mistake? Allowing 30 nations to be involved. That's the easiest way to make a mistake is to have more people involved. The way to have no mistakes is when you have very few people involved. And so offensive cyber is generally the sole purview of, um, of a nation state. Now, in the case of the United States, we may work closely on occasion with nations like Great Britain and their GCHQ, or with, with uh, Israel, who have, uh, I think it's unit uh, 8,000 um, that does cyber stuff. But even though we work with Israel, it doesn't mean that the work we do with Israel is shared with the British, because the Israelis don't want the British involved, because that's a threat of, uh, I think we may do something with the Germans, but we won't tell the British. The British may do something to the Germans, but tell us, because it's very secretive, this world of uh, offensive cyber uh, capability. First of all, um, a lot of the stuff we do, I, I mean, we, one of the more infamous examples is we listened in on the uh, cell phone conversations of Angela Merkel, our German ally. We spied on the uh, German intelligence service at the same time we were getting the German intelligence service to help us spy on the French. I mean, so the the the, the concept of NATO coming together to carry out offensive cyber actions is just a joke. Um, if there's a war, then the United States would use its offensive cyber actions um, in a way that supported overall NATO objections, object, uh, um, object, uh, just like the British would. And there might be some in coordination, and that coordination might take place within the uh, cyber conglomerate. But uh, that would be something that occurs after the fact, I mean, after there's a conflict. I don't believe there's anybody in the cyber conglomerate today plotting offensive cyber operations against anybody because it's, if, if I'm a, uh, an American in a NATO building, um, all my information is shareable to everybody, the Turks, the Greeks, everybody. I don't get to do an American only thing. Um, I'm now part of NATO. The second I move it, if you want something not to be in NATO, you keep it in an American only club, you know, but once you enter NATO, uh, you know, the, the, the NATO facility and you put on that NATO hat, it's shared by all, there's no secrets, there's no secrets. So, and, and offensive cyber is some of the most secretive work done in the world. And I just don't see NATO um, being involved in that during, during peacetime. So Scott, we never talk about Estonia. And Estonia actually has one of the most evolved cyber technologies, as I believe. And it's not too far away from Russia. <laughs> so your thoughts on Estonia in this current situation? Well, it's the same I have on all three Baltic countries. Um, I. I I respect the fact that the Baltic nations are not a historical part of greater Russia. Um, you know, and what I mean by that is they're, they, they're treated differently than say Ukraine or Belarus or, or something else. Um, and so I, I respect their, their, their right to independence. You know, it, it's, it's real. It's, I don't view them as fake um, art, you know, artificial entities. Having said that, though, one has to look at their history and understand that these are problematic nations, um, especially when it comes to being able to have responsible relationships with Russia. These are nations that have deep-seated deep -seated hatred for Russia, uh, and they are nations that use their membership in NATO as more of a means of provoking Russia than defending themselves so because they feel almost invincible now that they're protected by you know, chapter, you know, article five of the, of the charter, uh, collective self-defense. 
Um, they're also very small. And what I mean by that is small nations like small dogs um, mm. can bark. Dogs. <laughs> bark they can't bite um mm -hmm. and Australia has a lot of bark very little bite their their proximity to um to russia um gives them some advantages from an intelligence perspective meaning you know anytime you are in close proximity either to human to human contact or um, you know, able to intercept radio signals, uh, et cetera, um, you have intelligence value. If you think Estonia is doing any of this on its own, you're wrong. Um, little dogs need big owners. And the big owner of Estonia is the United States and Great Britain. Whatever capabilities Estonia and Great, uh, has, uh, these are capabilities that are that are born in conjunction with the United States and Great Britain exploiting Estonia's proximity to Russia, just like we exploit Lithuania's proximity and Latvia's pro proximity. Um, the Estonians are very good at um, what I call uh, disinformation. Um, they, they, I believe they played a role in, um, in some of Christopher Steele's disinformation. I believe they, they played a, a role in spreading disinformation about Russian involvement in um, the hacking of the, of, the, of the DNC in 2016. Uh, they're very good at that. But again, to think that they do this on their own um, is absurd. Estonia works in concert with a greater game plan that's been prepared by the United States and Great Britain. Um, I also think that Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania are poison pills for NATO, that the day will come when NATO rues ever allowing these three nations to join them because they, together with Poland, will probably be the cause of World War III. And the last thought that will go through, hopefully, all NATO ministers' heads before the nuclear bomb eliminates them and their nations is, why in God's name did we let those countries into NATO? because they don't care about NATO. They only care about their own little selfish interests and how they can hurt Russia. They're not looking for good relations with Russia. They don't want good relations with Russia. They want to harm Russia and they don't mind being used by forces who share that objective. That's my opinion of Estonia, Latvia. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for saying this. And actually, before I go into Poland, I wanna tell you, when I look at Estonia and with my little knowing, but I think it's enough to kind of have an idea that it almost looks to me that country has been like a testing ground for the, the how you say, like everything is digital, like literally the citizens life, everything is on the computer. They are very much ahead as far as the technology. It almost is like Australia was for United Kingdom, you know, the prisoners, you remember historically, right? So Australia was a testing ground in certain time in history. And now we have this in Estonia. And I mean, <laughs> it just looks like this is the, the, this, the concept that has been tried there first if you know what I mean. And now with Poland, um, and you know, I'm here in Poland right now, and I actually am observing as much as I can because it's hard to listen to those informations. Um, so I don't own TV, but I come across certain YouTube channels that I just choose a certain amount of information because it really aggravates me what the Polish government is doing. Um, with everything, with the refugees, with the money, with everything. But let's talk about this cut, um, the peacekeepers going from Poland to Ukraine. Um, do you think this actually might really take place? I know there is such a plan. There have been statements actually about it. Um, do you think this will take place? Or you think it might actually be 
avoid it? Well, I'll start out by saying that I hope it will be avoided because it's 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 a one way trip to hell uh, for any poll who participates in that. Um, first of all, it would if it's done, it will be a national initiative, not a NATO initiative. So Poland will be very much on its own. Uh, they won't be protected by uh, Article Five, and unless NATO approves um, the Polish. Um, uh, inter introduction of forces into Western Ukraine as part of a NATO um, effort, which means other NATO nations would join in, um, there will be no protection. So the question is, why would Poland do this? Now, the, the most logical explanation is that Poland is overwhelmed by Ukrainian refugees and that there is a a actual necessity to create a safe haven in the uh, along the Polish Ukrainian border on the Ukrainian side where Ukrainian refugees can come they can have shelter they can get food they can get medical care but they're not coming into Poland and therefore the European Union so you create a buffer that keeps them out of the European Union out of Poland but you also provide for their legitimate humanitarian needs. And in order to have uh, a, a safe zone, the people that come there, in order to convince them to stay there and not to rush the border and try and get into Poland, they have to be convinced that they're safe. And so that's what the presence of Polish forces would do, is, is to say, you're safe, you're under our protection. Um, and I believe that that's a legitimate, um, a, a legitimate concern. And, but again, if I were the Poles, I would be talking with Russia nonstop about this saying, we have a problem here, all right? We don't want to create a problem with you, but you're creating a problem with us. Okay, whether you like, know it or not, whether you wanted this to happen or not, your special military operation is flooding us with refugees. And we have a humanitarian obligation to deal with this. And so what we are asking from you is to give us permission to go into Western Ukraine and create a non-permanent buffer zone that can be a safe haven, no offensive weapons. It'll just be Polish troops, their presence, military police uh, to, to create a symbol of safety so people come and stay there. And we need to do this and we need your help to do this please let's work together on this one. And I believe Russia would actually say, yeah, we, we, can, we can support that. So why isn't Poland doing that? Why isn't Poland reaching out to Russia and, and, and doing this kind of logical diplomatic outreach? Ask yourself who in the Polish parliament is pushing for this? Go look up their names, look up their political affiliations. They're not the humanitarians that are doing this. They're the nationalists that are doing this. This is about um, changing the borders of Europe. This is about exploiting the crisis Ukraine finds itself in to create the conditions for the return of lost territories. The, the areas of Galicia that were given mm -hmm. to Ukraine in the aftermath of the, well, they were stolen initially by Russia in 1939, retaken by the Germans in 1941, and then mm -hmm. given back by the Russians in 1945, um, 46. Can uh, I just say, can I just see, say here? I had two different historical books when I was learning history because of this, what you just said. First was until 1989, and then I had the second history books that was rewritten after the round table negotiations. That's what I want to say. Well, I mean, history has a way of being rewritten, <laughs> depending on the facts that are available. Um, you know, but the point is, and, and a lot of people also would say, well, why would Poland stab Ukraine in the back? Well, Western Ukraine is, is home of the Bandera ideology. And I think most Poles know the history of what the, Bandera, the, the, band, the Banderistas did to the Poles. 
I think they, they forgot, Scott. They forgot. They murdered 100,000 of them. Murdered 100,000 Poles. They would surround Polish villages in Western Ukraine and slaughter women, children, men. They would slaughter not, not 50, which is a lot, not 100, but 1,500 at a time. This is what Banderas do because they are about Ukrainian racial supremacy. They are about the purification of Ukrainian race. They view the Poles as subhumans. They view the Russians as subhumans. This is why they killed 100,000 Poles and 200,000 Russians in an effort to purify Ukraine. And if you're a Polish nationalist, you know this, you know the history, and you are resentful. And so I believe that there is an element in Poland. And Poland is also very Russophobic. I mean, most, most uh, people don't, <laughs> don't remember <laughs> the, um, the, the first, uh, what was it, the Budenis uh, cavalry uh, moving on, on Warsaw in 1921. They don't know about the miracle of the Vistula, you know, and 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 and. Uh, uh, not Vistula, yes, the miracle of Vistula. Yep. Mm -hmm. well, the Americans are clueless about this. Every pole, it's right there in their heart. They know it. They live it. Yeah. It's a great victory, mm -hmm. and they, they they have they have fought Russia. They have won against Russia. Their nation mm -hmm. is built on that victory, and then they were betrayed by Russia. Yeah. And so. The loss of Western uh, Ukraine is an act of betrayal that must be reversed, but they forget that in exchange for the loss of that territory, they were given Cilicia, Pomerania, and mm -hmm. parts of East Prussia. And once you start redrawing maps in Europe, for the Poles, it never ends well. Whenever Europe decides to redraw the map, Poland always gets smaller. So the Poles need to be careful here because they're, they're engaged in a, in a very dangerous um, game, a very dangerous game that isn't as pure as simply providing humanitarian care. This is about blatant nationalism. Um, this is based on a perception of Russian weakness that doesn't exist. You know, Poland is, is part of, and I'm sure we'll probably talk about this later, but Poland and Germany and the United States and NATO have provided the Zelensky government with a strategic depth that is the salvation of Ukraine right now. What I mean by that is, as we speak, there are thousands of Ukrainian troops on Polish soil being trained by the Polish military on how to use uh, NATO equipment, Polish tanks, artillery pieces, etc. There's hundreds of uh, Ukrainians in Germany being trained by the United States to do the same thing. Um, Russia can't attack these places. So the Ukrainian soldiers get a nice hot meal three times a day. They have a nice barracks. They, they get to take showers. They get to have physical training. And they, they get to go out and learn how to use equipment uh, trained by NATO uh, uh, trainers. Um, and then they get to organize, and then they move up to the Polish border, and then they cross in using whatever rat lines they use, um, and they reconstitute inside Ukraine. So as Russia is destroying the Ukrainian army in eastern Ukraine, and they are destroying them, it's a humanitarian disaster what's happening that the Ukrainian government is of you know, not telling the Ukrainian people what's going on, the true extent of their defeat. Um, I mean, we see with uh, Azov Stahl, mm -hmm. you know, they, they have to change the narrative. Uh, this is about the heroic defenders. We can't let them die. We are evacuating them. No, you got beat and you lost thousands of people. Uh, it was a huge defeat for you. Um, and you're on the verge of having um, 10 to 20,000 more. In fact, it may have already happened as we're speaking. The Russians, closing the pincers on the Severodonetsk pocket. And inside that pocket are between 16 and 20,000 Ukrainian soldiers who are now doomed to die or surrender. They have no other choice. They can't break out. 
So they're going to get squeezed and squeezed and squeezed and squeezed and squeezed, and they're all going to die or surrender. This is a reality. That's 16 to 20,000 on top of the 55,000 Ukrainian soldiers that have already died, been wounded, or captured by the Russians. 55,000. That's a big number. Now we're adding potentially 20,000 on top of that, so we're up to 75,000. We haven't counted all the casualties from Mariupol, but I'm sure you can add another 5,000. That's 80,000. 80,000 casualties. Now, normally that's the kiss of death, but what Ukraine is doing is mobilizing territorial defense brigades in Carpathia and Western Ukraine. Now, these brigades are composed of local reservists who contractually are only obligated to defend their particular zone. But Ukraine is taking them and shoving them into the front line with no training, no equipment, no coordination. They're just plugging holes and letting these guys die by the hundreds every single day to buy time while this strategic depth that's been created by Poland and Germany allows Ukraine to reconstitute competent military forces with good equipment and bring them back in and move on. So they're 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 e long e, e, they're, they're trying to buy time. They are trying to buy time. Well, and again, the goal is to bleed Russia white. Basically, um, to keep this war going, to sacrifice as many Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. We don't care about the Ukrainians. All we want to do is weaken Russia so they can never do this again. That's the stated objective of both Lloyd Austin, the U.S. Secretary of Defense, who made that statement, by the way, not only in Ukraine, but in Poland, and then Jan Stoltenberg, the Secretary General of NATO. So Poland needs to understand that that's the Russian perspective. Now, I put on my Russian hat, and I look at Poland, and I say, you are a hostile agency. Mm -hmm. You are engaged in a direct war against us. It's not Polish troops, but you're using your territory as strategic depth for Ukraine to enable Ukraine to reconstitute military forces to come back in for the sole purpose of killing Russians. And now you want me to sit back while you move 40,000 Polish troops into Western Ukraine? Are you high? <laughs> Russia's not going to allow this. Russia will destroy every single one of them. And, and Poland has to know this. And then what happens? What, you outrage, oh. outrage Poland's sensibilities? They have, you know, because if you've taken anything away from this war, is that not only, and we all know theoretically that war is violent, war is hell. You know, we can write whatever we want and all that. Modern war kills people in horrible fashion and in large numbers very quickly. This isn't some drawn out command. Medieval. War. Yeah, this is not medieval war. Well, it almost is. Because kind of, days yeah. in the same day, you fought, you lost 30, 40,000 people in one battlefield because you just hacked each other to death. Mm -hmm. We're hacking them to death similarly. We, uh, but artillery will come in. The Poles have not experienced this kind of combat in the living memory of anybody in Poland. All right, all your Polish generals, all your Polish colonels, all your Polish lieutenant colonels, they don't know war. What they know is eating borscht, eating sausages, eating sauerkraut, getting fat uh, while they get their pay and their promotion and all this. They don't know war. And these fat, overstuffed officers are going to lead their inexperienced conscript troops uh, who don't know anything about war either. And they're going to march off with Polish citizens waving the flag saying Slava Poland or whatever they say in Poland. And off they go. And the Russians are going to pour artillery fire on them. And they will all die instantly, horrific deaths. Is Poland ready to accept 5,000 dead in one day? Because that's what's going to happen. Because this isn't a special military operation. This is war. And Russia will not play games. And it will be, or, and then what happens? Do the Polish people quit? Or do the, does it resolve them even more to mobilize now to fight Russia? And I think it would probably resolve them to mobilize, which means they're going to, poor, poor people, it's going to be like lemmings running off a cliff. And then what's NATO going to do? Let Poland commit suicide in Western Ukraine? Um, and then what you'll see is, is you know, now, now we have Poland involved in a ground war in Western Ukraine, and NATO will provide Poland with the kind of strategic depth that they provided Ukraine. 
and this conflict will become even more widespread um, with the potential of Russian missiles striking Warsaw, striking uh, bases, not because they're NATO, because once, once Poland engages in a war on its own initiative without NATO backing in Western Ukraine, it no longer has chapter five protection, article five protection. Um, this is just a very dangerous and foolhardy thing. I am hopeful that the Polish generals who, while they may be fat and corrupt, aren't stupid. And they aren't falling for the Ukrainian propaganda. It doesn't take a, a, a rocket scientist to figure out what just happened in Eastern Ukraine. We've been predicting it for some time now, but what just happened is the Severodonetsk pocket has been closed. 16 to 20,000 Ukrainian soldiers are trapped. And when this happens, it's a total collapse of the Ukrainian front. The Ukrainians just lost two battalions trying to do a counterattack in Izium. They're gone. Ukrainians have some armored forces up near Kharkiv that are making propaganda videos. They're going to get cut off and destroyed. Ukraine's going to lose the totality of its military in eastern Ukraine that quick. It's happening as we speak. So, and Scott, Scott, can I tell you, can I ask you here? So, who do you think is giving those orders to Poland, those advices to Poland? Who is it? Is it White think, House? No, not at all. I think the White House would be saying, don't do it. Um, because it's, it's, there's no chance of success. There's only a chance to expand the conflict. This is purely a, I, I think it's purely a domestic Polish thing driven by Polish nationalism, misplaced Polish nationalism. They see in Russia, you know, and Russia is sort of contributing to this. I'm not going to let Russia off the hook, but, um, you know, Russia is redrawing the maps of, of Europe as we speak. Um, you know, not just with Crimea, not just with Donbass, but now with Kherson, the land bridge connecting the greater, you know, now they're talking about a greater Crimea um, uh, territory. Uh, we still don't know what the fate of Odessa will be, uh, but, you know, Russia is redrawing the map. Uh, and Russia, I believe, will try to connect um, its land bridge with Transnistria um, and formalize what has been an informal um, independence of the of, of the Transnistria region. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's a dangerous game because now, you know, what what happens to the Hungarian um, population in Ukraine that now says, I want to be part of Hungary? What happens yeah. to the Romanian population that says, I want to be part of Romania? What happens to the the Poles who say, we want our territory back? In, uh, in, in, and then what happens when the Germans say, well, we want our territory back too? Um, so, Everyone wakes up for their land, and yeah. And then, and, and and what happens when the Serbs say we want Kosovo back? Mm -hmm. Because imagine the the signal that you're sending when when Poland says we want Western Ukraine back. The Serbs are going to say, well, if you want to swallow Western Ukraine, we're going to swallow Kosovo, and we're going to go ahead and take Bosnia and Serbia along with us. Um, this is a very dangerous. That's when when people speak, they they talk about you know Europe has never been more unified. Europe has never been more fractured. I, I mean, agree. It's, it's a joke. And when they say um, NATO has never been stronger, NATO has never been weaker. I mean, if you think about it, NATO is a joke. They're a joke. Their only chance for relevance is to bring in Sweden and Finland as a means of distracting. Uh, both the organization and Russia away from the real problems. Ask your Polish generals how many tanks they think they could mobilize and send into Western Ukraine. First of all, they'll be a hard time getting half their tanks out of the barracks because they don't work. Um, hmm. And the crews that are in them don't know how to operate them because they haven't done a real exercise in a long time. Um, God forbid they go to war. Um, they, they, most of their equipment is old you know, Soviet air equipment that's been upgraded somewhat. The Ukrainians received 200 T-72 tanks from Poland, but those tanks don't work. The Ukrainians hate them. The Polish military is a joke. They have some nice special forces. They don't have an air force worthy of the name, uh, and they don't have an army capable of fighting the kind of sustained ground combat that we're seeing in Ukraine. And, and yet they want to play big boy. They, they want to run with the big dogs. I mean, it's, it's, you know, they're not even a chihuahua, you know, at least a chihuahua can fake it. Um, 
The, yeah, you know, that's true. That's true. It's, I don't mean to be too insulting, but I, I'm just being realistic here. And all of NATO's like this. The United States, even. I mean, we have some good combat units, but we don't have enough of them, and we don't have enough of them in Europe. Um, you know, we, we keep talking about 100,000 troops. Numbers mean nothing unless they're backed up with tanks, artillery, aircraft, uh, helicopters. And yeah, we got some of those. We could put up a good fight for a week, but then what happens when we suffer casualties? As we will. We've got no replacements. And we got nothing in the United States that's ready to come over in short order to replace. So we're putting good forces up front, but they'll because mm -hmm. they're good forces, they'll be the ones taking the lead. They'll get ground down and there's nothing to replace them. Um, so NATO's in a big trouble. This, 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 this June summit in Madrid is going to be a very interesting summit. I'd like to believe that NATO would sit back and have you know, an honest discussion with itself about where they are and where they want to go. Unfortunately, I think it's going to turn into a Jan Stoltenberg, you know, warmongering cheerleading session. Um, but hopefully some nations like Croatia, like Turkey, maybe France, maybe Germany, start asking the hard questions. Where are we going? How are we getting there? How much will it cost? And what do we hope to achieve once we get to where we think we're going? And is it worth it? Because, you know, I think a conversation on this will lead to the inevitable conclusion that it's not worth it, that NATO is actually in a stronger position right now trying to seek peace and stability in Europe than they are trying to confront Russia and expand a war they can't win. So, Scott, I want to ask you this. I wonder, because I, I just want to say a little bit about my history now because you will understand this and ask your thoughts on this. You know, when I was growing up, it was different Russia. Maybe this will explain the uh, Russophobia that is still active, okay? It was very different Russia. It was Soviet Union. They had, you know, uh, that was not like Stalin Russia, Brezhnev Russia. Th that, was the, that was Soviet Union Russia. We were under, we were in communism, we were under that. I had to learn Russian, I had no choice. So we were bombarded with this. When I was in the primary school, like basic school, every Friday, pretty much, we had to go to watch the movies how Russia um, liberated Poland during the Second World War, not to forget that, right? So they were showing us Auschwitz-Birkenau, those camps, documentaries. and. Like imagine 11 year old child, 12 year old, like this is traumatic, right? Watch, watching this, but we were going to watch this. So with that, I had this, um, how to say it? I had a certain approach to Russia because of this throughout most of my life. I, I was kind of resentful. I was not interested even to go there and travel and see places, which normally I would because I love to explore. And it has been very, very recently for me. And especially with this uh, intervention now. And not about the Putin, because I, I kind of look at Putin always a little bit different. But I started to look at the country and like it get to me finally. I said, this is not the same Russia. Why other people don't see that this is not the Russia from 1981. This is Russia that is a different country. And they still have this image. And I think that's why for majority of Polish people, they really don't like, like it's soft way saying many of them hate Russians because they still have this image of suppression and they were killing Polish people somewhere there. And I know for you, you, you said in, your, in our first conversation and many other interviews, you, you grow up in this and you, you were saying that it's better to be dead than red. And you were actually in Russia, you know, working there and meeting those people and experiencing the reality of the place. So, so do you think, like, what will it take for people? Because in your case, like you were totally against Russia. You were programmed to hate them, to kill them. And then you went there and you literally saw that they're just like 
us. They are other people, right? They want the same freedom and happiness and take care of their families and be healthy. So what will it take for people to see this, Scott? You know, history, uh, uh, history is a solution because before you can go forward, you got to know where you came from. Um, I, I use another uh, saying all the time is um, you can't solve a problem until you accurately define the problem. Because if you haven't accurately defined it, you're not solving anything. You're, you're just doing something that's not related to reality. Um, you know, I will say off the bat, I'm not Polish. Um, I have a, a, an understanding of Polish, modern Polish history that comes from it's the derivative of my studying of Soviet and Russian history. So, uh, you know, I know full well what happened to Poland in World War I. I know it was, you know, the battleground. Um, it was part of the Russian empire. Uh, it, it declared, um, it became an independent state afterwards. Um, you know, the, it, it was condemned by the Danzig Corridor, um, which made it a target for, for the Germans who were resentful of, um, of, 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 of losing um, you know, the, that, that territory. I know in 1939 that um, Poland was stabbed in the back by the Soviet Union who through the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact um, carved up Poland uh, and invaded weeks after the German invasion. Um, I know this history. I know that uh, the Russians uh, captured um, tens of thousands of Polish officers and then uh, slaughtered them in Katyn Forest. I know this, I know, I know what the Russians did. Um, I know that um, Great Britain, France um, went to war in 1940, 1939 actually, to defend Poland, um, that this was what started World War II. Um, I know that the British um, were in favor of the Lublin Committee, I believe it was, um, the, the, the the, the Poles who fled Poland to London, um, or maybe they, they were the London, and then Lublin might have been in the Soviets. But the bottom line is you had two mm -hmm. um, competing uh, post-war visions for Poland. One was a British vision of what Poland would be, which sort of was returning Poland to its pre-1939 state. And then you had the Soviet vision, which was um, the post-1944-1945 state, meaning Russia occupies it, Russia gets to dictate the future, etc. I also know that Russia, um, that, that Poland was a major source of, um, if, in fact, if you want to talk about the creation of NATO, we're really talking, uh, it's because of Poland and because of the differences between um, Great Britain and the United States and the Soviet Union on the future of Poland. You know, some, um, some agreements had been made at Yalta um, furthered at, 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 at Potsdam, um, but then the United States um, felt that the Soviet Union was not um, adhering to its agreements. The Soviet Union felt that the United States was under pressure from Great Britain to create a, a different Polish reality. Um, and, and I also know that, uh, for instance, in 1946, um, Secretary of State Burns gave a speech, a very famous speech at the time, uh, in which he challenged uh, the Soviet uh, position in, in in Poland, and he talked about the um, the uh, the border, the the uh, western border of Poland, and how it's going to be fixed. Uh, and he pressured Russia to accept the Oder Nice River line as opposed to more territory that the Russians wanted. Um, and that at that point in time, the Poles felt betrayed by the West, and that it put <laughs> Poland firmly on the side of Russia of the Soviet Union. And that the, so the, the, the Soviet goal for Poland wasn't to be an occupied, subjugated people, but to be what was known as a cordon sanitaire, a, a, a buffer zone uh, between Russia and the West, which is all Russia wanted. They wanted a peace treaty in Germany, and then they wanted sort of a neutral, pro-Soviet Poland, but not an occupied Poland, um, et cetera. But then... Churchill gave his speech in Fulton, Missouri about the Iron Curtain coming down. Um, next thing you know, we've created NATO. And Poland now, instead of being a quasi-neutral buffer state, 
is now a frontline state in the new conflict between East and West. And then that changed the way that the Soviet Union viewed Poland. It was, it no longer could be viewed from a hands-off perspective, but now it had to be viewed as part of Russia's immediate sphere of influence, which required more control over Poland, um, et cetera. And it changed the dynamic in the relationship between the Polish people and the Russians. Instead of being uh, independent people, they, they, they began to feel like they were an occupied people. Um, and the Warsaw Pact made it a occupation under, you know, under the you know, military type occupation. So I understand the roots of resentment. Um, I lived in Germany when uh, Solidarity um, first emerged. Um, I, I was in Germany in 1981 when, uh, 8081, and, and, and the crisis where it looked like Russia or the Soviet Union might come into Poland and NATO was saying, what are we going to do? Are we going to intervene? And there was real concern about a war, um, you know, mm -hmm. over, um, you know, and then I, I watched from a distance as uh, the Berlin Wall came down and Poland, like the rest of East Europe, um, became free free of the, the Soviet yoke. Um, and um, and I, I watched as Poland um, transformed into a nation of um, anti-Russian resentment, um, dominated by uh, nationalists who um, then used uh, NATO's desire to expand to their own benefit um, being one of the first nations brought into uh, NATO um, and have been leveraging that position ever since for increasing Russophobic policies uh, and postures on the part of NATO. I understand all this. I may be getting something wrong here. I mean, as a, a true Polish historian might say, oh, you're forgetting X, you're forgetting Y, you've overemphasized Z, underemphasized X. That could be. I don't <laughs> pretend to be a Polish historian. But what I'm saying is, I think I've laid out a historical roadmap of great complexity and emotional distress, that this is not an easy situation mm -hmm. and there is no easy solution. Um, and so long as Poland is in NATO, I don't see a solution because NATO only strengthens the Polish nationalists. The, the, the best friend moderates, moderates in Poland have is the European Union, actually. Because as we saw before the, a lot yes. of people forget that before the Ukrainian crisis, Poland was in danger of being kicked out of the European Union or the European Commission. Because yes, of their, their, people their, forgot. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah, they, Poland's they, the bad guy. Poland's the autocrat. Poland's the dictators. Poland's the far right wing nationalists. Poland, suddenly Poland's wonderful, man. It's all cool because Ukraine's like that and we need Poland on our side. But we forget that there's some significant problems between Poland and Europe that haven't gone away. They're still here. Um, and that this Ukrainian crisis is papering over these problems, but they still exist. And um, I think they're manifesting themselves, you know, because when, whenever you try to suppress um, unhealthy tendencies, they tend to manifest mm -hmm. themselves in other ways. And I think the Western Ukrainian initiative is a manifestation of some of these nationalist tendencies that have been papered over because of Poland's need to get along with Europe right now. Um, it's a very dangerous situation. I don't know what the solution is because, you know, the uh, whenever you engage the forces of nationalism, you disengage the forces of logic and reason. Um, mm -hmm. And Poland right now is, is a wash in a sea of nationalism. And um, it, it's impossible to have a reasoned, logical discussion with a Polish politician today. It's I agree with you. No, it's, it's imp it, it really seems, although I believe everything is possible, but watching their actions, listening to them, is just hard to imagine how you can influence or stop them doing certain things that are harmful, richly harmful. And it's very strategic almost. Like I'm, I'm watching this, I'm like, they know exactly, I mean, either they are completely imbeciles and so stupid, 
or they really know what they are doing intentionally? Well, sometimes imbeciles um, can get away with stuff just by being bold <laughs> you know, no, and having nobody stop them. Uh, I, I, I don't like giving nationalists too much um, credit for intellectual capability because uh, if they had genuine intellectual capability, the kind of uh, intellectual curiosity that a normal human has, they might not be as nationalistic as they, as they are and recognize that Poland cannot exist in a vacuum, that the world does not rotate around Poland, um, that Poland has zero gravitational pull on the rest of the world, that Poland's not as important as Poland thinks it is, that the Polish people aren't as grand and glorious as they think they are, um, and that by acting as, as, as if you are, you just uh, enhance resentment um, and the danger with Poland enhancing resentment is right across the border are the Germans. And they don't like the Poles. Never have, never will. And across the other border are the Russians. They want to like the Poles, but they can't because the Poles don't like them. And Poland is going to find out the hard way that getting squeezed by Russia and Germany never ends up good for the Polish people. They have it as good as it's going to get right now. The borders of Poland today uh, make it a big nation, but they're controversial borders. Um, you know, they, they had to sacrifice the West to gain in the East, uh, but they gained a lot in the East, some pretty productive areas. Um, uh, the, you know, the Silesian uh, industrial region, et cetera. Do they really want to get in the business of redrawing the map? Do they not believe that as Polish nationalism erupts, German nationalism will erupt too? And if I were a Pole, the last thing I'd want is some nationalist Germans, especially at a time when NATO is encouraging Germany to spend 100 billion euros to re-equip an offensive-oriented army. The Poles really want the Germans marching again? Um, and you really want to get Russia thinking about driving on Pol Warsaw again? Because Russia's done it before. This wouldn't be the first time Russia took Warsaw. Um, it might be the last. So the, the Poles need to be really, really careful here. Mm -hmm. and, and, the, and, and the reason why I say that is Article 5 isn't what everybody thinks it is. Article 5 of the NATO Charter. They think it means an attack against one is an attack against all, meaning that everybody's going to come running to your defense immediately. Read Article 5. It doesn't say that at all. It says that an attack against one will be considered an attack against all, but each NATO member must evaluate the situation and determine if they want to respond and if that response will be military in nature. Which means that if Poland starts messing around and gets involved in a shooting match with Russia, and everybody else is saying, you did that, we didn't want to have any part of it, do you really think Italy is now going to mobilize three armored divisions and send them to die in Poland? Nope. Think Spain's going to send their air force over to fight for the Poles? Maybe not. Because there's a difference between that and Russia just waking up the mo in the morning and saying, I'm attacking Poland. If Russia just attacked Poland out of the blue, I think NATO would come to its defense. I do. But if Poland wants to play the nationalist card and get involved in games of redrawing the map in Western Ukraine, I don't think people are going to be so enthusiastic about um, activating you know, their military under Article 5. Article 5 gives them the option to opt out. People never remember that part. It isn't automatic. They can opt in or they can opt out. And if Poland creates a war that only benefits Poland and they expect to have all of NATO supporting them, I think you'll find a lot of NATO members are going to opt out. But I really, truly hope Whatever energy of my own I can generate here to prevent this, I will put this prayer out for this not to take place. 
Yeah, it's a good, that's a good prayer to have. So I have more questions, but the sun is shining and I don't want to go and pull the curtain there. So I want to ask you something that I haven't asked you in our first conversation we had, although you kind of went there ultimately with the second interview we had. I wanted to ask you then, how deep is the swamp in Washington? But today, I'm not going to ask you this question. I want to ask you, looking at what's going on in United States, with many people that you have experienced in your lifetime, personally, you interacted with them. My question is, is there anyone who whose opinion you still value and respect? Well, anyone, yes, of course. I mean, uh, you know, uh, Seymour Hirsch, a uh, Pulitzer winning, um, you know, investigative journalist. I have the utmost respect for him, um, fact-driven man, but he's 85 years old. He's not running for office <laughs> ever. Um, so do you mean any politician or any person? Uh and a politician that is actually maybe still in quite high position? Unfortunately, no. Um, I mean, some, some people like Rand Paul on occasion do things that, um, that impress me. His, 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 his uh, position on uh, Ukraine funding is the right position. And it was a brave position, uh, it was unpopular. Um, and I respect politicians that, that do this. But here's, here's the problem with Rand Paul. He has to run for re-election. And re-election costs a lot of money. And he will have to sell his soul to special interests to get that money. So he is bought and paid for. Even though he is able to do things such as uh, stand up against Ukraine, he is also... <laughs> a vote that is as much bought and paid for as any other vote in Congress. The American political system, by allowing outside money, by basically, I mean, the, the, the thing that killed America, and we were already, we already had some serious problems, but the thing that killed America politically was Citizens United, um, the, the Supreme Court uh, case that elevated corporations uh, and gave them the same rights and protections uh, in terms of campaign donations as citizens. A corporation can never be a citizen, but thanks to the Supreme Court, they made them. And now we have uncontrolled money um, and corporations can bring to bear money uh, in a way that individual citizens can't. I mean, you know, Bernie Sanders did try to run a, a campaign based upon donations. He famously, I forget what the average thing or $27 or something like that. Um, we contrib My wife and I contributed to uh, Bernie Sanders uh, because we thought that that was a breath of fresh air. Um, you know, somebody saying he doesn't want to be controlled by, um, you know, by, by corporations, by special interest money. Um, but Bernie Sanders is controlled by special interest money. All politicians are controlled by special interest money. Uh, they you know, the House of Representatives is, is particularly vulnerable because they are on a two-year cycle. You, you, get, you have to run for re-election every two years, um, which means that the moment you get sworn in as a congressman, generally the first thing that happens is you have to start making phone calls, raising money for your next uh, election campaign. That your entire, most of your effort isn't spent trying to do good by the American people. It's spent trying to raise money so that you can stay in office. Um, I mean, Congress is a political self-licking ice cream cone. It, it exists only for its own entertainment um, to get itself reelected. It doesn't, when it passes legislation, that legislation uh, is in support of moneyed special interests. Um, somebody's making money somewhere every time Congress passes a law. Congress doesn't pass laws that are for the good of the American people. Congress only passes law that are good for corporate interests. Uh, this is a this is a reality, and anybody that's in the, engaged in this process has been corrupted, and I have no use for them. So the the short answer, I just gave you a long answer, but the short answer is there's not a single purpose, not a there's not a single po politician in America that I have any faith in because I know for a fact they have all sold their soul to get where they are today, 
and they are selling their soul to stay where they are. Um, you know, the, 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 the politicians with integrity, um, you know, aren't, aren't in the game right now. Um, I mean, I, I have respect for Tulsi Gabbard. Um, but, you know, in, or, in order for Tulsi to run, she's going to have to make money. She has to raise money. Where's she going to get the money? To be competitive, you have to raise, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. Who's going to give her that money? Um, and it's not an equal playing field when you have, you know, the Joe Bidens and the Hillary Clintons and the, uh, you know, Mitch McConnells and the Mike Pence's of the world able to tap into their, their various special interest bases. Um, to have a genuine American patriot to try to run for office today, they'll, they'll never make it through the first cut because they can't afford it. It's all about money. It's all about money. So, so Scott, let me ask you within this, sorry to interrupt you, but this to me looks like there is literally corporations and politicians in this. There is no, what, what the voters, what the citizens who vote have to say, they have no saying at all, zero? Of course they have say, because ultimately, you know, the, the, it's a citizen that cast a vote, but um, we have no say in who's running for office. I mean, it's, you know, we say it's democracy, the greatest democracy in the world because I get to go to a polling station in November and go in and shut the thing and no one tells me how to vote, except you already have, because I didn't have any say on who's, who I'm voting for. I don't like any of them. I don't want any of them. None of them represent me. All of them were picked by special interests and yet somehow America is a democratic nation because I get to decide which special interest representative I, I, I am putting into office. Unless the American people are in control of the process of selection, the process of election is meaningless. We have to select our leaders before we elect our leaders. And we don't get to do that because it's all about the money, all about the money. I, I, short war story, if you want a short war story. Um, when I resigned from the United Nations, there was a moment in time where I was a hero. Uh, to the Republican Party, because they thought I was beating up Bill Clinton. They didn't understand that I was beating up bad policy, not a bad, not a bad, not a bad politician. Uh, and when I turned my criticism on Republicans, you know, they got a little nervous and realized that uh, I wasn't who they thought they were. But for a minute, I was considered a hero. And there was a guy um, named Jack Kemp. He was uh, a, a congressman from Buffalo, New York a former Buffalo Bills quarterback, very attractive looking former athlete, smart guy, nice guy. He ran uh, under Reagan administration. He was the head of the housing and uh, urban development. Uh, and he had some really progressive ideas on how to fix inner city problems, et cetera. I don't know if they would have worked, but for a Republican to have the ideas that he had, it was like, well, you're a free thinker. I like this. So I always liked Jack Kemp. And I got a phone call from Jack Kemp after I resigned. And he said, Scott, I need you to come to a, to a gathering putting together. I said, well, what kind of gathering are you putting together? I just want you to meet some people. I said, all right, I'll, I'll meet these people. So I went up there. Well, it turned out it was a fundraiser for me. They wanted me to run for Congress. And they were coming, Jack Kemp had brought together some of the deepest pockets in the Republican Party. And, and we were sitting in a manor in Westchester, New York, and they were trying to get me to run for Congress. And he said, it's an absolute, if you want to run, you'll be elected. You're a hero. The American people love you. I said, well, <laughs> who would I represent? I said, this is uh, Gilman's district. Uh, he's a Oh, no, 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 no. We're not. Gilman will stay in. I said, but I live here. No, no, we'll relocate you. We'll get you to a, we'll get you to a safe district. I said, but why would they vote for me? I'm not from there. No, 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 because they love you because you have strong American values and they love you. And I said, you don't even know who I am. And I'm sitting here talking to these guys. Oh, we know enough about you. And I said, really? <laughs> and I could see Jack Kemp saying, shut up, stop, don't say anything. You're ruining it. <laughs> but I said, ask me two questions. Ask me what my policy, my, what my stance is on gun control and ask me what my stance is on abortion. Because these are the two big Republican issues. Man. And they said, okay, well, what, what, what's your stance on gun control? I love guns. I'm a Marine. I, I, own a, I own a shotgun. I have a pistol for home defense. I, and they're all like, yeah, that's our guy. I said, but you know what? 
I believe every gun should be registered. I believe that before you have the ability to shoot a gun, you got to prove that you know how to shoot a gun and that you have to go through training. It has to be responsible. You make me do that to drive a car. Why don't you make me do that to own a gun? Mm -hmm. Well, Second Amendment. I said, Second Amendment doesn't talk about that. It talks about well-regulated militia. And part of a well-regulated anything is responsible ownership, which means that when you have a gun, the gun should be registered. You should be trained to use this gun. You should have to go through continual retraining and all that stuff. And they were like, oh, very controversial. So, I about abortion. How do you feel about abortion? I said, look, I'm the father of two daughters, twin daughters. I couldn't imagine the world without them. I mean, I couldn't imagine a situation where they weren't born. And so, you know, I, I'm just personally opposed to, to abortion because I can't imagine the world without my girls. I said, but you know, it's not my choice. Not my choice. I, 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 I'm the father, but I'm not bearing these children. The woman gets the choice. Now, I will encourage any woman that I impregnate, and that will only be my wife, to take the baby to term, that we're going to raise the baby. I would encourage any woman who was pregnant to find an alternative to abortion, to preserve that life, that as a society, we should give them every opportunity to bring that life into this world and then nurture this and bring it and raise it. But, you know, we don't have that. And right now we have a whole bunch of scared women out there who are pregnant and they don't know what they're going to do. They feel trapped. They feel imprisoned. And they are the ones in control. And therefore, it's their choice, not my choice. And I don't think I have any right to tell them what to do with their lives. Oh, man, they ran away so fast. And Jack Kemp said, well, there goes Congress. And I said, I never wanted it. He said, I know that's what made you attractive is that you didn't want to be a politician. We could have used you in Congress. He said, you're a damn fool. He said, because all you did today is, is prevent a good person going in Congress who could have made a difference. And I turned to him and I said, okay, but are these guys, I, I, I said, hey, let's be serious here, Jack. These guys write a check right now. What strings come with the check? Well, I mean, oh, you just got to have dinner with them every once in a while. I said, no, they, they, nothing comes for free. They're not going to write money mm -hmm. for free. Now, here's the other thing. I go through this right now. Are they going to give me a contract that says every two years they automatically write the same check and I don't have to come back to them? Just write it for me so I can just stay in D.C. and do my job? Or do I have to come back and hold their hand again and talk to them again and, and do this all over again? And how much time is that taking from the, me representing people I don't even know? You're going to put me in a district I don't even know. I wasn't raised there. I don't have any connection with them. And I'm going to spend all my time not learning about them but asking for money from these guys who don't know me. And when I tell them about me, they run away from me. I said, come on, Jack. I never would have lasted in Washington. He said, yeah, you're probably right. But I mean, that's Congress. That's why I have no use for Congress. Because you, good people can't go into Congress. If a good person goes in, they're a bad person coming out. The only good congressman is a one-term congressman. Because then I know they didn't sell out. If you're a one-term congressman, I know you didn't sell out. I know you did the right thing, and I know you lost re-election because you wouldn't beg for money. You're trying to do the right thing, and the interest destroyed you. Because the people liked you the first time around, liked you enough to elect you. But if they don't re-elect you, it's because you've irritated some people. You've made them mad. You're not playing the money game. I like those kind of politicians, but they don't survive. I so appreciate you sharing this very, very much. But I cannot end here because I want to ask you one more question. Okay. <laughs> that is, what? how do you see the future of United States? Honestly, at this point, how do you see this? Do you see this changing in November or since we just spoken about this, how they are all? It's really one party, like we said in our previous conversation, one corrupt party, right? But how do you see this, Scott, ahead for US? Uh, well, I actually think that America, back in the old Republican, old Democrat days, we were one party with two different names. We we're basically one, one, one political party with, with two faces. We, we had mild, mild schizophrenia. Um, but hmm. thanks to Donald Trump, we're now two, two parties. And this isn't good. Normally, you'd like to say, well, that's a good thing, isn't it? No. We have one party, which is the Democratic Party which has, has attracted 
enough of old Republicans to have the old, but the old establishment isn't anything to applaud, isn't anything to embrace. I can't be proud of the old establishment. I was against the old establishment. I didn't want to be part of the old establishment. So it's not as though I'm saying that's good. It's not, it's bad. The old establishment was destroying America. What's come out of that now is the counter-establishment of Donald Trump, which is anarchy, chaos. It doesn't stand for anything. It doesn't stand for the Constitution. We know that because of January 6th. They don't stand for uh, you know, due process because Donald Trump is the antithesis of due process. He's, I want it now and I want it any way I can get it. And he's encouraged a whole bunch of people who are rebelling against the establishment to rise up. And we are a nation that is falling apart. You say, what is the future of the United States of America? The United States of America can only exist if the Constitution of the United States of America is indeed the law of the land. We have a Supreme Court right now that is, is on verge of, of you know, revoking Roe v. Wade. Now, people say, well, that's abortion policy. I don't care what it's about, frankly speaking. I don't. What I care about is the concept of established legal precedent, the law of the land. And I had several Supreme Court justices testify before the United States Senate in a constitutionally mandated um, session where the Senate is, has to provide consent. That consent is based upon a hearing where the nominees honest answer, uh, answer honestly under oath. And they all said that Roe v. Wade was the law of the land. It was established precedent, cannot be changed. And now they're changing it with, a, with, a, with an opinion that says it never should have been put in, which means they lied. And when you have the Supreme Court lie, they're just politicians. They're no longer judges. So we don't have a functioning Supreme Court. And, and the Supreme Court can't be said to function if you have five, four decisions. It's supposed to be the supreme law of the land. Well, if it's so damn obvious that it's the supreme law of the land, it should be a 9-0 decision. Because all, all the great legal minds should agree that this is what the Constitution says. But instead, we get a 5-4 split, which means four of the best legal minds in America disagree. So don't tell me it's the law of the land. Tell me that there's five people who happen to have all the same political convictions. So it's not about the law. It's about politics. That's what it's about. This Roe v. Wade thing is not about the politics, about the law of abortion. It's about the politics of abortion. And the Supreme Court is politicized. It is a ruined institution. And that's one of the three co-equal branches of government. So it's gone. Throw it away. The presidency, it's a joke. Literally a joke. We elected Joe Biden. And before that, we elected Donald Trump. And if you're telling me that 320 million, million people can only produce those two candidates, then we are in trouble as a republic. So the executive branch is gone. It's a, it's a product of not the will of the American people, but the will of political parties under control of special interests, which brings us to Congress. And I already told you where I stand on Congress. So I have the Constitution of the United States of America no longer matters. It stands for nothing because the Supreme Court stands for nothing, because the executive branch stands for nothing, the, uh, the, 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 the legislative branch stands for nothing. So what is the United States of America? The it's people, a, the people. Could be, but now, now you say the people, okay. Now, I gotta be careful here because I don't wanna, Thomas Jefferson famously said that the tree of liberty must be refreshed with the blood of tyranny, of tyrants. Mm -hmm. So if you want the people to be in charge, that means that the people need to rise up. And I'm not, I'm not asking for that because there is no such thing as the American people anymore. We're broken into special interests. Thanks, we used to be the melting pot, but we're always a fake melting pot. We're a melting pot as long as all the ingredients that were thrown in were white. Italians could learn to live with Irishmen who could learn to live with Poles who could learn to live with Germans who could learn to live with Englishmen because they all looked like this. But when we started to sprinkle in some pepper, the white, the, the white melting pot didn't want to have the pepper brought in. Don't put pepper on me. I'm talking about blacks. We don't want the blacks to be part of us. We want them separate. And many of the blacks didn't want to be part of the white stew to begin with. The Latinos don't want to be part 
Some do. Yes, you can always find people that want to get together. I'm one. I don't give a damn what your color, color, your color of your skin is. I care about the quality of your heart, the quality of your brain, the quality of your character. But unfortunately, the way politics works today, that's not how it works in America. We are a racially divided nation, and it's only getting worse. It's only getting worse. So when we talk about the people rising up, it's not as if 300 million people are going to rise up, cleanse government, reinstate the Constitution as it's written, and move forward as a purified, new, relevant nation. They don't know the Constitution. You know, the people who come in and to, to be American citizens had to take a test on the Constitution before they could become a citizen? You have to pass that test. Yes. The legal immigrants we talk about. Right. Well, no, but anybody, before you can take your oath as a citizen, you have to pass the test, regardless of the route that you came in. I will bet you right now, 90% of American citizens, if you gave them that test right now, couldn't pass it. How can you defend that which you do not know? I defend the Constitution. How many people have taken an oath to the Constitution but don't have a clue what the Constitution is? I mean, I've, I've confronted too many service members like this. I took an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution. Really? What's 14th Amendment? Huh? Protection against illegal search and seizure. You don't know that? What's Third Amendment? You don't know that? And you know the First Amendment, because we all talk about it. You know the Second Amendment, because oh, you're a God, God, you're a gun carrying American. What's Fifth Amendment? What's Sixth Amendment? Which amendment gave the women the right to vote? Which amendment did away with slavery? Come on, man, you're an American. You took an oath to this damn document. You don't know it. You don't know it. If you believe in America and the Constitution, one of the first things you need to do every week is get up and find out what new Supreme Court decisions have been passed. Because it's all, the only thing the Supreme Court does is the Constitution. They interpret the Constitution. That's your document. The Supreme Court has said the Constitution belongs to the people. So the people have to defend it, have to own it, have to nurture it, have to raise it, have to care for it. And we don't. Therefore, we give the Constitution to the politicians who act on our behalf, but they don't even know the Constitution they read. So we're a nation that is adrift. We have no anchor. We have no meaning. We have no, we don't stand for anything anymore. And the fact and the, the proof of that is what the Supreme Court just did with Roe v. Wade. You can be for it or against it, and I respect either one of your positions. But the thing about a democracy that's based upon the rule of law is that at some point decisions are made, and you have to stick to those decisions. A decision was made about Roe v. Wade. It became the law of the land. We had a binding Supreme Court decision, and we had Supreme Court justices swear under oath to the United States Senate in a constitutionally mandated process that they respected that, and they lied. We stand for nothing as a nation. We stand for nothing as a people. So when you say the people, what people? The ignorant masses who don't even know the Constitution they're supposed to be defending? So the future of this country is dire, dire. And that bothers me because, you know, I love this country. <laughs> you know, I, I truly do love this country. I love the potential of this country. Uh, and we have some, you know, our democracy functions wonderfully at the local level, wonderfully at the local level. I mean, you know, we have an ongoing crisis in our street as they're seeking to develop um, the neighborhood in our time might open up feeder lanes and increase traffic on roads. And I'm watching the community mobilize and go to the town hall and say no and demand things and the government was trying you know all, all government tries to be sneaky but the government try, was trying to sneak things through and they can't now because the people have risen up and the beautiful thing about a local community is you get enough of us angry you lose your job so the politicians going oh god no i gotta listen to you now because it's a political issue suddenly it's important because it's about my job we work wonderfully you want to watch a community get mobilized put a pothole in the middle of a damn road and every morning as they're driving to work, and boom, damn pothole, you know, they got to pick up the phone, call the highway department. Why aren't you filling the pothole? Oh, the supervisor cut the, the budget. We don't have enough asphalt till next week. No, 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 dude. I will be voting for the other guy, not you, unless you find the asphalt. Next morning, pothole is filled in because <laughs> about local politics, man. That's how it works. Anyway, but the higher up the food chain we go, 
the less the, the more distant things come from us. So if it's not a pothole, if it's not cars coming down my street, I'm not getting as mobilized. And then when you take it from county level to state level, again, now we're now we're trusting people. We're handing off responsibility to people to handle it. And then we get to the national level and we're just totally powerless. So America functions wonderfully at the local level. We do a good job. We're not perfect, but we do a good job. But we fail at the national level. It's an abject failure. I've never been more embarrassed of my country than I am under the last two administrations. I mean, Donald Trump, I tried. I tried. I tried my best. But he embarrassed me because he lost touch. I, I don't think he ever had touch with the Constitution. I mean, he was, he, was a, he was a unique character with a unique style. But if that style isn't anchored to the Constitution, then it's not American. That's just a guy going off being an autocrat and a dictator. It's got to be constitutionally based. And he, he had no respect for the Constitution, and we saw that on January 6th. I mean, you can think the election was stolen, all that stuff, but you don't disrupt the, <laughs> the Congress confirming the results of the Electoral College per the co constitutional order. Twelfth Amendment required that to happen, and you can't interrupt it. That's interfering with the work of Congress. That's disrupting the constitutionally mandated process. And the president of the United States was encouraging a demonstration, even if he didn't want them to storm the Capitol, he wanted them what? To surround the Capitol and let them hear your voices. No, Donald, that's not how it works. The American people's voices get heard on election day. And they were heard. And Congress now was collecting, was counting the votes. And you got to be man enough to say, peaceful transition of power. That's what makes America great. You win elections, you lose elections. But no matter what, when it's done, the peaceful transfer of power is what makes this country work. And he disrupted that. And he disrupted it in a way that empowered, if not the worst president in American history, the second worst president in American history, Joe Biden. Um, and, 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 and so, you know, this country is adrift, and we're now broken into two camps, which are irreconcilable. You can't get the Trump camp and the Biden camp together. They won't come together. They're like magnets, you know, opposite polarity. You try and get them to come together, they just push each other apart. And if, if in America, if you can't get them to come together, we're ruined. We're destroyed. I mean, that's what, you know, you say what you want about the old system, you know, two, par you know, two, two different names, one party. But when you brought them together, they went, and at least they were a whole. We weren't a perfect whole, but we were a whole. Right now, we're, we're this. And the Democratic Party's in danger of fracturing even further. So as a reply, then we're a bunch of pieces that'll never come together. And it, it, it bothers me. It scares me. Um, and, and, when, and the problem with that is that this kind of dissolution, this kind of um, fragmentation is not conducive to confidence. It makes people afraid. And when you're afraid, you tend to shut down your sensories, your ability to see, to absorb, to learn. You stop empowering yourself with knowledge and information. And instead, you build sheer shields of fear. You push away things that are different, things that challenge you. You wrap yourself in a cocoon of limited comfort. And um, so we're a nation now that's going to be held hostage to individual fears. And those individual fears will find that, you know, like magnets to come together. So we're now going to get communities of fear. They're <laughs> not only of what's happening overseas, but what's happening at home, what's happening here at home. And if these are racially, um, racially segregated communities, that's not a good thing. If they're economically segregated communities, that's not a good thing. Um, and if it's a mix of that, I mean, we're, we're just going to find America is going to be this fractured society, dysfunctional society that um, at some point in time is going to collapse, going to collapse. So long story, short answer, I think America's doomed. Oh. I... 
don't want to think like that. I don't want to either. You asked me a question. I tried to give you an honest answer. <laughs> but I mean, otherwise, I'm just, I mean, I will work. I will spend the rest of my life trying to prevent that outcome and trying to encourage my children uh, not to run away from this country, but to embrace this country. I mean, that's a tough, that's a tough conversation to have with today's youth. Because there is no faith in our government. There is no faith in anything. To convince, to convince your children that they need to go and become part of what I have said is the problem. Well, why do you want me to become part of the problem? Well, because the only way you can fix the problem is to be inside and, and fix it from within. Um, but that's, you said that there's no hope. Well, that's my position, but maybe there's hope if good people get engaged and you guys should go do it. That's a tough thing to ask kids to do when you don't believe it yourself. I mean, I'm not going to lie to my kids. Um, and I'm sure other parents are having similar conversations. Um, I mean, the only hope for America is, is in our youth. But, yes, if we, I, I agree. but if we keep um, scaring them away, um, I mean, again, I don't want to get too political here, but we've demanded from our youth that they get a college education. We've made that a prerequisite in America today. Now, some people have families that can afford college tuition. They've made the taking of loans very, very easy. It's very easy to pay for a college education. They've made it impossible to pay off the loans that you have to take for a college education. So we have taken our youth and convinced them that the way to gain access to the American dream is to bankrupt yourself, go in debt to get a four-year degree that when you come out, you find is useless. You can't get the job. You have to go back to your waitressing job. You have to go back. It's very difficult to get up there, especially the, the, the fact that we allow, when I say allow, it's a choice, but you know, what do you major in? English literature. Yay, go get a job. Nobody wants to hire a English, English literature major. No kidding. But I'm $80,000 in debt. Welcome to the world. But I can't, I, I got it. They're charging me 12% interest rate. I can't, I can't afford it. You know, I, I get an old beat up car that takes the rest of my money. I, I try to pay rent. Uh, but by the time I'm done, I have $3 left over each month. So I either move into my parents' basement mm -hmm. or I live in a perpetual state of, uh, of, of, of poverty. And we've condemned an entire yes. generation of American kids to this. And we're- The slavery. It's a slavery. Absolutely. And there is a solution. There is a solution. The government could solve this problem. But unfortunately for Americans, the man we elected president is the guy who made this happen. Mr. Senator from Delaware, who, uh, when, when, when they were redoing bankruptcy laws, made it um, impossible to include student debt as part of your bankruptcy. Uh, so even if you fail, if you failed in everything, you're still yeah. going to have to pay off that student debt. It's a permanent economic ball and chain around your neck. So we've destroyed the incentive of, of America. I mean, they just graduated another class of, of college students. They're, you know, they we're in that graduation season. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're all depressed. Yes. When I left I, college, I was like, oh my God, the world's there for me. Let's go. And I had some debt. I, my parents were military. They couldn't afford to send me to where I took $30,000 worth of debt to go. Well, but I, I joined the Marine Corps and part of my paycheck every month went to pay that off. But I had a job in the Marines. I was excited about life. Uh, and eventually, I, I, I think it took me, it took me, um, I think, close to 15 years to pay it off. Uh, but I paid it off. Um, but I had the ability to pay it off and it wasn't as much of, of, of uh, mm -hmm. you know, but these these kids today, they 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 graduate, and the first thing they're going to be hit with is they they get a notice from their loan people how much money you owe and how much your first payment's going to be. And you know, the average first payment's like five hundred bucks. They don't even have a job yet, and they and and, and 
they got to put up 500 bucks a month now. And and there is an inflation that whatever other expenses they had, it will be yeah. double or tripled. Yeah. Right. So we we've you know we we're, we're put we're putting a lot on a generation that's already so deep in debt. Not just in terms of society's debt, you know, because they're 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 also inheriting, you know, our national debt. They're the Absolutely. ones Absolutely. So yes, national debt and your college debt, you know, and I'm not an economist, but I, I would say this. If I were the president and I forgave student debt, people say, well, you're going to put the country more in debt. I would say maybe, but you know what else is going to happen? That kid now that was trapped in poverty because they had to pay $500 a month on, uh, on student loans. Um, they now have $500 extra a month. And the first thing they're gonna do is probably upgrade their, their living conditions. Um, so eventually they're gonna try and become a homeowner. So they're gonna buy a home. Now they're committed to my community. And then they're gonna pay taxes and they're gonna buy a car and they're going to raise a family. All the things they can't do right now. If you're living in your parents' basement, you're not thinking about getting married and raising kids. But if I liberate you financially, over the years, they're gonna pay that debt back tenfold. As productive members of society, they're trying to build society. But we're creating an entire generation. And there are exceptions, don't get me wrong. I mean, my daughter, one of my the guys that graduated, both my daughters are doing well. Um, struggling, but doing well. Um, the one of their friends uh, became an engineer. He's doing quite well, you know, but others are, are, are struggling with the debt, you know? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, between 40 and 60% of the students that graduate from college are, are, are struggling with debt. That's not- But, 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 but Scott, can I just, number. something yeah. came to my mind in, in regard of this. I think this is, the whole point is, is not going to be just the student loan debt, because in order for many of them to even communicate, like commute or drive around, many of them even don't have cars, let's say. So they have to have another, uh, ask for another loan for the car. So yeah. this, is, this is just the beginning of being a debt slave, pretty much, because yeah. they really don't have enough money. <laughs> So they have to borrow the money. So then they pay the interest rates, which are constantly rising. And it's never ending. That's the it whole point. Made, the, the, the Fed just made it more expensive to have a loan uh, by raising yeah. interest rates. And interest rates are going to go up to try and control an, an inflation. So it's, a, it's a debt trap. And we've, we've trapped in, in you know, entire generations. And this is a time when we need those generations not to be focused on. Because, you know, when you get into a debt trap, you know what happens? become a slave to the establishment. Yes. So your whole existence is about serving the establishment. And that's what sustains the establishment. You said you wanted the American people to rise up and make change. You can't. You're slaves to the establishment that they would have to rise up against. So now, now we've depressed both of ourselves. Let's go back to our hope that uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe the next generation can find a solution to this, um, this problem. I still somehow, maybe this is strange, but I really f see the future will be great. I cannot tell you how this will come about. I cannot tell you what actions we'll be taking in order for us to get there, but I do see that bright future and in our lifetime. So I hope so. I, I hope, look, you know. <laughs> I hope so, um, but I don't know if the um, if the genesis of this bright future is going to be coming from the American shores. Um, I think um, let's put it this way: go to China right now, and get on a high speed train. You can, first of all, because there's a lot of high speed trains in China. Go and look at the quality of their uh, of their train stations: clean, immaculate efficient fly into new york city and um and 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 and, and, and try and catch a, a train from uh from the airport into into new york and then try and get a train out of new york city anywhere in america try and catch a, take the subway in new york city this is the big apple this is the city that represents america when people come in 
it's decaying, it's rotten, it's disgusting. Um, and we can't even agree as Americans to to pass you know, infrastructure, uh, you know, bills to, to rebuild this, to make America the bright shining city on the hill. Our infrastructure is crumbling, like our nation is crumbling. And they are uh, sending another forty billion dollars. Forty billion dollars to the Ukrainians to uh, uh, to waste. Uh, it's not just forty billion. Again, that's just money. I know money means a lot. It means everything. But you know, I'm I'm somebody who also recognizes that that forty billion probably means forty thousand lives. That's how I view it, and not Russian lives. We're giving money so that more Ukrainians die. And that's nothing more disgusting than that. Nothing more disgusting than that. And what we're defending democracy in Ukraine. Has anybody taken a look at what Zelensky's done lately, banning all opposition parties? The only political parties that are allowed to function right now are of the far right parties, the nationalist parties. Um, there's no democracy in, in, in there. He, he rules by martial law. The, the secret cabal that's behind him is the, is the Azov militants. Um, and, and we're giving money to this. Establishment, um, yes, to them, so exactly. Too political here, but did anybody take a look at the symbology on the gun and, the, uh, the, the, and, and on the uh, clothing of the um, shooter in Buffalo? And realize he's using the same right wing white supremacist idea uh, symbology that the Azov battalion uses. Um, don't we understand that when we support white supremacist nationalist movements overseas, that that has a, a, a legitimizing impact on the hate filled pockets here in America? These remember, I told you the ignorance based people come together. So, what we're doing in Ukraine is empowering these white nationalists here at home, and then they act out like they did in Buffalo. You think that's a one of, you think that's the only time that's gonna happen? That's the future, America. That's the future you're, you've earned, thanks to your policies, both domestic and foreign. Everything's related. We have to stand for something. And the only thing we should be standing for is the Constitution of the United States of America, which means we probably, in our wisdom, should go back and listen to the people that helped craft it. People like George Washington, who warned us against entangling alliances abroad because they only lead to war. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing for Americans to embrace today? The concept of maybe we shouldn't be seeking conflict everywhere in the world today, that maybe we should be learning how to live in peace with one another. I'd like to send a delegation of uh, people. I mean, I, 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 to, I honestly think I, I, I could succeed in this. I could fly to Poland and grab a bunch of your not your, not, not your politicians who have already sold their soul, but your, some 20 year olds. And I'd like to sit down and break bread with them and get to know them and talk to them and then take them on a tour of the world. And I, I would just take them to three places, four, I'd take them to four. Let's start with the United States, introduce them to my country. So this is America. This is the real America. Some of the most beautiful things you'll ever see in your life, but also some of the most disturbing things you'll ever see in your life. And the reason why I'm showing you this is I want you to understand that we have great potential, but we've also failed that potential. So anybody who sits there in Warsaw and says, America is the ideal, think again. We got a lot of problems here. Then I want to take you to Russia. I want you to break bread with the Russians. And you may not want to do that, but I pretty much guarantee by the time I finish, you guys are going to be hugging it out, getting drunk with one another. You Polish guys, you're going to be checking out those Russian girls. And those Russian, you Polish girls, you're checking out the Russian guys. You can find out they're nice people. They're nice guys. These are people I could, I could live with. I could play with. I, 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 man, I don't want to fight these guys. We could do that. Then I'll take you to China. They look different than you. But look what they've done. Look what they've accomplished. You know, right now, if you're in Europe, you say, well, we want to reject, you know, Orientalism and Asian this, but... Do you really want to reject that high-speed train? Wouldn't you like to have a high-speed train like that, connecting you know, Warsaw with the rest of Poland, with the rest of Europe? Uh, wouldn't you want this kind of efficiency? Um, this, this, uh, now, there's some bad things about China, too. But I, do, I want to show you some, 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 some good things, too. Then I'll take you to Germany. That'll be the last place we go. And I'm not going to show you. I don't want you to break bread with the Germans. I don't want you to. What I want you to do is visit some places, some hard places, some tough places. Bergen Belsen, Dachau. I want to take you to Nuremberg. 
I want to take you to Berlin. Then I want to sit down and talk to you about Germany because the, the, what Germany was could be the future of Poland. That's the direction that nationalism takes you. You don't want to do that. You don't want to become Germany. Now, I'm not condemning the German people. They're fine people and all that, but Germany created Nazi Germany. I mean, you know, yes, there's some historical point, but it grew inside Germany for a reason. And Poland needs to respect that and understand that and fear that. And that's what I would do. That would be if I had a billion dollars, I would, I would, I would seek to, to give that kind of education to, uh, to the Polish youth because I think if if they could see that, they could then put Poland in proper perspective, and um, and understand not just the limitations of Poland, but the potential. Because Poland's centrally located in Europe, it's right there, man. It's everywhere, and instead of being the terrain that invading armies cross over, which is the direction they're heading right now. And this is going to become another, you know, Poland could be the connectivity. Yes. It could be the connectivity between old Europe and Russia. Arrest, arresting stop on the way to Moscow from Indeed. Berlin. Yeah, from, from Beijing, exactly. And you know, Scott, can I tell you, I think we, I want to end here because you just gave a very beautiful solution to how we can heal this and solve this. And I believe in this, you know, it actually made me very emotional when you were saying this because I spent 17 years in the United States and I went through good times and bad times. And I was in a very, well, not crazy depth, but I put myself through American lifestyle in depth. And it took me a long time to come out of it. And I was a slave to it. Yeah. And I, I, I know how much beauty is there and how much potential is there and how people are the majority of people is absolutely in my opinion wonderful but yeah. i also i also know that there are enormous challenges like everywhere else and people struggle and the more poverty hits them the more irrational people can become. And that's like, again, everywhere else in the world. And I see that solution that you just gave us. I think I truly believe in this, that maybe not everyone has to be this nomad traveling, but that with that comes a sense of exposure and getting to know another nationality, culture, and finding through the uniqueness, actually finding the sameness and this connection, and that will save humanity. That's what I believe. Let's go for connectivity. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Scott. My goodness, we went really long today, but I hope everyone appreciates Scott's time as I do. Thank you so, so much. Well, thank you and for having me. Uh, I'm sure my employer will forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank Have you, everyone. Day.